Hello, I'm Chris Simmons and I'm here to talk to you about debugging embedded devices running GDB. This page is just showing you the licensing for this slide, so I'll leave you to read that at your own leisure. This is a little bit by myself. Um, I have been using Linux as an embedded operating system for over 20 years now. I've written a book on the subject uh, and you can uh, follow me on Twitter at 2 Software and you can find me on LinkedIn and also you can see my blog looking after the inner penguin at 2net.toco.uk so this is all about debugging so bugs happen we need to know how to find them and in this case we're going to be looking at interactive debug debugging using GDB there is a lot more stuff about this in my book go read chapter 14 uh, and before we move on, I want to just highlight the, the quote at the bottom from Brian Kernighan, who says, Debugging is twice as hard as writing the code in the first place. Therefore, if you write the code as cleverly as possible, you are by definition not smart enough to debug it. Yep, I've often felt like that. Not that my code is in, is in any way clever. So make your codes uh, straightforward. Uh, don't obfusc obfuscate. <laughs> do things in the best way possible. So this uh, tutorial uh, is going to be uh, some slides, me talking, but also uh, some demos. Yep, I know, demos. We'll see what happens. So for the live demos, I shall be using my laptop as the, uh, as the development machine. So this is running a version of Ubuntu 18.04, in fact. And then for the target, I'm going to be using a good old Raspberry Pi. And I have prepared a Yocto project build for it uh, because that is, makes it look more like a typical embedded system. I have prepared uh, a, a set of instructions which you can download, download from that link. Uh, I encourage you to do so and to follow along with the video. So this is the Raspberry Pi. It is uh, an ARM-based device, uh, actually has a quad-core uh, ARM V8 architecture processor, um, which is a 64-bit processor, but we're actually only using it here in 32-bit mode. It has a micro SD card slot, which is what we're booting it from, and it has an Ethernet port, which we'll be using for networking. Everything's going to be command line, I'm afraid, so we will not, for example, using, be using any HDMI videos. Um, so the uh, operating system is built using Yocto project. Go follow that link there. And this is the com this is one of the most common <laughs> ways of building embedded Linux systems. And the there are instructions on how I set this all up in the workbook. So let's talk a little bit about tool chains first of all before we get on to the debugging, f uh, uh, <laughs> before we get on to the real debugging. Let me define what a tool chain is. So a tool chain is a C compiler, specifically GCC, the GNU C compiler collection, plus a package called binutils, which we need for the assembler and the linker, and some other useful tools as well, plus a C library, the C library allows us to uh, access the operating system underneath, which is going to be Linux. And of course, GDB, which is what we're talking about here in the first place. Now, there are two different ways of developing code for a, a system. You can do it native or cross. With native development, then, you develop on the target, you run on the target. And this is what you do on a PC, for example and also uh, on, say, a Raspberry Pi running Raspbian. But it's not the most common way of doing this for embedded devices. The reason being that most embedded devices are not really powerful enough or not configured in the right way to do compilation natively. It requires fast processors, it requires lots of memory, it requires lots of storage. So it's much more common to do cross-development. So with cross-development, we develop on a, on a uh, host system, uh, typically running Linux, 
and we run on a target. And uh, that's what we're going to be doing here in this tutorial. And I've used Yocto to create the cross development environment for us. So we need a tool chain, uh, of course, and we're going to be using the fourth uh, bullet point on that slide. We're going to use the uh, build system Yocto project to generate the tool chain for us. Now, looking at cross tool chains, the first thing you may notice is that they have peculiar, the tools have peculiar names. So they have a prefix of the form Arch Vendor Kernel Operating System. For example, here we have MIPS EL minus unknown minus Linux minus GNU. Oh, and this, the prefix always ends in a final minus. So in this case, the architecture is MIPCL, which is little Endian MIPS processors, not very much used these days, but there they are a thing. Uh, the vendor is set to unknown, which means that it's either unknown or more likely it's just not important in this case. Uh, the kernel, of course, is Linux, because we're always talking about Linux uh, in this context. And the operating system is normally set to GNU. So you take the prefix, such as that, and then for each tool you want to run, you just uh, append it to the prefix. So to run the comp cross compiler, you type MIPS EL minus unknown minus Linux minus GNU minus GCC. That is your cross compiler. I want to take a little bit of a detour and just mention a few things about ARM cross compilers since it's quite likely that you'll be, in an ARM, be using an ARM processor. So ARM tool chains have gone through uh, a couple of generations. The first generation uh, followed the format I've just described. So you would find typically something like ARM-unknown-linux-gnu. Uh, dash then there was uh, the second generation of uh, interfaces of tool chains using what's called the extended ABI. An ABI is the application binary interface, which is a set of rules uh, for making function calls and such. So with the new incompatible ABI, the tool chains uh, acquired uh, the extra string EABI. So now we have ARM unknown Linux GNU EABI. Then later generations of ARM processors acquired floating point hardware. So HF was added to the operating system part. Uh, and so on. There are, are even more complicated uh, combinations if you look carefully. So ARM tool chains extend the concept of the uh, tool chain prefix and they add in some hardware components as well as part of the operating system. Next, I want to mention the sysroot. So the sysroot of a tool chain is the place where the header files and library files are stored, plus some other configuration information. Uh, you can find the sysroot uh, from a tool chain by asking the tool chain itself. So you can use uh, the GCC command, add minus print sysroot, and it will tell you where it is. If you do this on your native tool chain, on your PC, you just type gcc minus print minus sysroot it will say forward slash so the sysroot is the top level directory for embedded tool chains uh, they are going to be something different so in my example here i have uh, another example of a tool chain this actually is a 64-bit arm tool chain ar64 from buildroot uh, and then it's going to gcc and it says its uh, sysroot is in that directory. So this is the directory essentially where I configured the sysroot in the first place. So the sysroot is always, for, for cross tool chains, is always somewhere else not in the uh, top level directory. And we need to know this stuff when we're cross compiling, but also when we're debugging, as we'll come to. So within the sysroot, you will expect to find uh, the libraries. So they'll be in lib and user lib. And if this is a 64-bit architecture, you may well find that lib64 is there, usually as a symbolic link back to the lib directory. 
And the other important thing here is the include directory. So from the sysroot, if you go sysroot slash user slash include, that's where all the header files should be. From the debugging point of view, the header files don't really matter, but we really need to know where these libraries are. So they'll be in the sysroot slash lib and in the sysroot slash user slash lib. So you can get information about your toolchain from the toolchain. Print this root is one thing. Uh, you can ask it the version with a minus minus version, and you can get the configuration information with a minus v. So I have created uh, a toolchain using Yocto project. I typed bitbake minus c populate underscore sdk, and then the image I was creating, which actually was called core image base. And that created for me a toolchain with this name. Well, actually, it generated for me a shell script, a self installing shell script, which would uh, install the, 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 the toolchain. So I run that shell script. Notice it ends in sh. And it extracts itself and puts it into the default install path, which for this is going to be opt slash pocky slash 3.1.3. That is because this is. Yocto project 3.1.3, the Dunfell release. And then to actually make use of the toolchain, I must source a shell script. So I type source, opt pocky 3.1.3, and then the, the uh, setup script is called environment minus setup minus, and then the, the toolchain prefix. Well, an extended form of the toolchain prefix, really. There is one little uh, oddity with the way that you use the Yocto project toolchain. That is that if you ask this toolchain to print its this root, it prints out slash not slash exist, which doesn't exist. So this is telling you that this is uh, not the way to run the toolchain. You don't actually, uh, you're not meant rather to run the toolchain like this. You are instead use, meant to use a variable called cc, which has been set up by the shell um, environment setup uh, from the previous slide. So if we look at $cc, we see these are the parameters we should use if we want to compile. And one of the parameters is the sysroot. So to compile a little program, I don't type arm dash pocky dash linux dash gnu eabi dash gcc. That will not actually work. I type dollar cc program on a compile minus o the executable. Incidentally, the this looks slightly odd on the slide. I use a dollar sign at the beginning of a line to indicate that you read a shell prompt, and then a space, and then the thing you actually type. So in this case, you type dollar cc not dollar space dollar cc. I hope that's obvious. The toolchain is not just GCC. There's a whole bunch of other things. Uh, amongst them uh, is AS. Uh, this is the GNU assembler. So that can take assembler code and produce machine code. Uh, we have the linker that can uh, link objects and libraries together. Uh, we have GDB, which is a thing we're going to be looking at, and a whole bunch of other things as well. Okay, so demo time. Let's have a look at the toolchain for the Raspberry Pi, and let's also boot up the Raspberry Pi, of course, and see how it works. So here I have uh, two window, uh, two terminals rather. The right-hand one I'm going to be using for the target for the Raspberry Pi. The left-hand one is going to be my development uh, machine. So I'm going to begin by uh, booting up the Raspberry Pi. And I have a serial terminal attached to it so that as it boots up, we will see the kernel messages uh, scrolling onto the screen. So this actually is a Raspberry Pi uh, B, uh, 3B. Uh, we're booting from the SD card. And it's up. There's the 
DHCP configuration come in and it says login. So I log in as root, no password. So this is a fairly small uh, Yocto project build. If I run the ps command, for example, there isn't very much going on here. The most important thing from our point of view is going to be there is a, an SSH daemon running called drop bear, and we're going to be using that to talk to the Raspberry Pi uh, to get a shell and also to copy files to and fro. OK, so uh, I'm actually going to, oh, sorry, one thing I need to do. If I'm going to connect to it via, um, uh, via SSH or via the network, I need to know what the address is. So I'm going to type ifconfig, and I notice that ether0 is that address. So now I can quit from minicom. I shan't use this again. And I can instead use SSH. Want to log on as root and give that IP address. OK, and then we're back where we started. OK, so over here I have uh, a copy of the well-known Hello World program and I want to compile that and run it on the Raspberry Pi. So I begin by sourcing uh, that setup script. So in art, pocky, and something or other. So now I can access the toolchain. I can, I can add something like arm, pocky, GNU something, uh, GCC. Oop. If I didn't put a T in there, that would be better. And we have uh, GCC version 9.3. Just to prove the thing about the uh, sysroot. Uh -huh. Typing is not so good today. Then it says not exist. But if I do the echo dollar cc thing, then it gives me the actual sysroot it's going to use. OK, so here's my Hello World program. Um, it's a slight variant of the Hello World program. It actually has a little loop, and it says Hello World four times. And I've got a little, little make file just to make it easier to compile. So I'm just going to type make. That is, uh, that's cross-compiled everything very, very quickly and nicely. And I now have a program called Hello World. OK, that has been cross-compiled. If I try and run it, it won't run. And if I type file hello world, it confirms to me that this is an ARM executable. Uh, it has been compiled with debug info, which has not been stripped. Excellent. So to try this out, I'm going to copy this now to the Raspberry Pi. So I can do SCP, hello world, we'll copy it as root. And I've actually set up um, uh, in my host file, uh, because I know that my Raspberry Pi will always come up with the address 192.168.42.2. So I've uh, set um, a name in, in my host file called rpi3. So that should work. I know it wouldn't. I need to say where to put it. So we're going to put it into uh, user bin. OK, so that has copied it to the Raspberry Pi. Over here in Raspberry Pi land, I can type, well, if I look in user bin hello world, there's the same program. And I can run it. And it says hello world 023. So fantastic. Everything's set up. We can compile things. We can run the results. So, now we can talk about debugging. Mm. 
So when we're going to debug things, we naturally need to uh, build uh, debug information in. Um, and you control this with a minus G option to GCC. So if you're not going to be debugging anything, you set it to zero. And then you can set it to increasing numbers up to three for more and more debug information. And as well as a minus G, you can also use minus G GDB and then the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3. Using uh, minus G GDB means that it creates the debug information in a format specific to GDB. Otherwise, it uses a generic format called dwarf. Um, in my experience, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference. Certainly for the things we're doing uh, in this tutorial, it doesn't matter at all. So all the things that we're going to be, you, you know, all the examples I'm going to be running, I should say, uh, I'm going to be compiling with minus G2, which actually is the default uh, source level debugging that you would expect. Um, next issue, next issue, pardon me, is going to be code optimization. If you've ever tried single stepping through optimized code, you will know it's not easy. Once you start optimizing things, once the compiler starts optimizing things, it starts doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And the code that actually gets compiled is not exactly the same as the code you wrote. So it is usually a good idea uh, especially if you're going to do single stepping through code to turn off or minimize the amount of optimizations that you need. Now you can do this explicitly by setting uh, optimization flag minus capital O zero. Sometimes that will cause uh, problems so there is another uh, common option minus O G. So these are GDB compatible optimizations. In other words optimizations that won't cause GDB too much confusion. Um, the examples I'm running, I've, I've uh, gone for the first option and I'm actually compiling without any optimization at all. So if we are doing cross compilation, we also need to do cross debugging. In other words, we want to run the debugger on the target, but we want to control it from the host. So we can do that using a program called GDB Server. Uh, GDB Server is actually part of the GDB package. So we run GDB Server on the target, and we have it load uh, the program we're going to debug. Uh, GDB Server doesn't care at all uh, whether there are debug symbols there or not. So usually the, uh, the binaries we put on the target are stripped, so they don't have symbols. It means they take up less space uh, in the storage. And then we're going to talk to GDB over a network connection. And we're going to control it from uh, GDB from our tool chain. And that copy of GDB needs to load the same program, but it's going to read the symbol tables from that, that program. So that's the basic setup. Let's see. Oh, not quite. Uh, yes, I've said that stuff. Ah, yeah. So uh, before we get to actually doing the debugging, we need to think a little bit about sysroots. So when the GDB that's running uh, on your host, when it comes across a library reference, uh, it needs to know where to find the library in order to find the symbol table for that library. In other words, it needs to know where your sysroot is. And generally speaking, it doesn't have any way of knowing this, so you have to tell it. So this is why we need to know the sysroot for our tool chain. We type set sysroot, uh, and then something like opt pocky 3.1.3 sysroots, and then the architecture, which is uh, something we'll come to in a moment. So here's a sample of a uh, simple debug session. I'm going to be running GDB server on the target on the on the Raspberry Pi. Um, I need to tell it which port number. So we're going to be using TCP, uh, a TCP network for the debugging. 
I need to, to give it a TCP port number to listen on. Uh, I tend to use 2001. And then the program I want to debug is going to be Hello World. So when we do that, GDB Server will load Hello World into memory and then set a breakpoint at the first instruction and then sit there waiting for a connection. Okay, so Hello World is not running at this point, it's actually waiting. So then on the host computer, I can run uh, my copy of GDB. GDB loads Hello World, and then that will give me a GDB prompt. Now I need to set the sysroot. Actually, in this particular case, it doesn't really matter, uh, but if I wanted to step into some of the libraries, I would need to set the sysroot. Then I need to make the connection between GDB and GDB server. So I type the command target remote, uh, the target address 192.168.42.2 and then the port number 2001. And when you do that, these two uh, programs will start talking to each other and you should see this message on the Raspberry Pi. Remote debugging from host and that's the IP address of my laptop. Now I'm in charge over here, so I can now do a regular debug session, so I can set breakpoints, I can continue execution, and so on and so on. Okay, I've said all that stuff. So what else can we do? So we can set breakpoints. Um, to set a breakpoint, you type break, and then you can type a line number, or you can type a function name. You can get a list of breakpoints you have currently by typing info break, and you can delete a breakpoint with delete break. We can control execution. Uh, so in the example a couple of slides back, I type continue, which I can abbreviate to C. That means continue execution. From a breakpoint, it means continue, continue running. Or for a breakpoint, I may decide to step. So if I type step, which I can abbreviate to S, that will step one line of code. And if it is on a function, it will step into the function. If I want to step over functions, then I use next, which I can abbreviate to N. And if I'm in a function and I just want to continue until the function ends, until it returns, I can type finish, which I can abbreviate to fin. There is also another command called run, which you may be familiar with from other tutorials. Uh, run does not work with uh, when you're doing a remote debugging like this. Uh, the run command essentially means load a fresh copy of the program into memory and then start it running from the beginning. That's not what we're doing. The, we, with remote debugging, we load the program using GDB server on a different computer, and then we make the link with target remote. So on remote debugging, you want to continue, not run. Um, next then, let's have a quick look at variables. Uh, so we can print variables with print and the variable name. We can change the variable to a different value. You can type set and then the variable name, sorry, set and then var and then the variable name and the value you want it, want it to have. Okay, so let's set up a simple debug session with Hello World. So over here on my Raspberry Pi, I'm going to use GDB server. Oops. And I'm going to use port 2001. And then the program I want to load is going to be user hello world. OK, so that is now loaded into memory. It's waiting for a connection. Over here, 
uh, I'm going to load the uh, GDB from the, the toolchain. I'm going to load the Hello World program. Uh, next, I'm going to set a breakpoint. Oh, no, I'm not. Uh, next, I'm going to link to the target. So I type target remote, and then the target is going to be at 192.168.42.2 colon 2001 uh, so now it says uh, remote debugging from host and it knows who I am and then over here ah yes so here I, I forgot of course to set the sys root um, I'm just going to carry on at this moment and I'll come back and redo this with the sys root so you can see the difference uh, but for the moment, I just want to set a breakpoint in main. That should work. I continue, and we're now at the main function. There is hello world, and I'm just going to single step through it with the n command next. So it's going to print out hello world, oh, and the value of i currently is 0, so it should print 0. So 0, hello world, and so on and so on, until we finish the program, and we're done. Ta-da! Okay, so let's quit from that and do it uh, slightly better. So once again, I set that up to listen. Um, I need to know what the sysroot is, don't I? So if I do uh, echo .cc, here's my sysroot. I really just want this bit. Now I do, let's redo the command. So now I can set the sysroot, I type set. Put in that stuff. Now I can do the target remote. Dot forty two dot two two thousand one. Break main. Continue. We're basically at the same point as we were before. Uh, the main difference, I guess, is that we don't get the rude messages about uh, missing sys roots and you can see that it has red symbols from the uh, linker and actually only from the linker but that's good so um, I'm just going to set this running oh no there's a, there's a thing I could do let's demonstrate changing variables so let's just step through this a couple of uh, lines so it's printed out zero it's about to print out again. So i currently is 1. Um, I could be mean. i is an integer, I think. What happens if I set it to a negative number? So set var i equals minus 3. Aha, minus 3, hello world. And then it counts up to 3. Okay, so that's all uh, well and good so far. Let's move on to the next thing. Um, so there's a lot of typing going on there uh, to set the sys root and to do the target remote and so on. And um, even for me, that's a bit too much typing. So let's look now at GDB command files. This is a handy meet thing. It allows us to put a bunch of, of GDB commands into uh, a file and then either have them executed at uh, when GDB starts up 
or we can also uh, on the next slide actually um, do uh, do this um, by adding new commands to GDB. So these command files, we can create a file called .gdb init in the current directory, and then when GDB starts up, it will read that file and run those commands. Um, we can also create a .gdb init in our home directory and put a bunch of uh, commands in there as well. Except that it doesn't actually work all that well. Recent versions for security reasons actually have disabled this functionality unless you put into uh, .gdb init a line like this, auto load safe, pa uh, safe path, and then the path to the .gdb init file. This is becoming too much like hard work. So there is the third option. We can create a gdb command file and then load it explicitly with a minus x option. So that's what we will be doing. So you can put into a command file any sequence of GDB commands. Anything you can type at the uh, command prompt uh, in GDB, you can put into a command file. And you can also do other things. So for example, I can create a new command using define. I use define, uh, the command name, then a sequence of GDB commands, and then I terminate it with the end uh, keyword. So I have set a, a, a simple little thing here which sets a breakpoint on main and then give, prints out my breakpoints. And then I can run it at runtime. I type b main and it sets a breakpoint and then it prints out all the breakpoints. So this is really handy for stuff that you do over and over. Okay, so demo time again. Let's try some of these things out. So first of all, over here on the Raspberry Pi, let's set that up to be waiting. So over here, here's my hello world. And um, yeah, what are things I have to keep on typing? So first of all, um, I really get bored with typing this uh, set sys root thing. There's really quite a lot of that. So I'm going to create a file. I'm going to call it gdb.init. And I just need to copy the thing that I typed in a little while back because it's a big long string. That one. So I can just put that in here. And whilst we're at it, so the other thing I have to keep on typing is the uh, target remote thing. Um, I may have to do that uh, multiple times, and sometimes I don't want to do it. So I'm actually going to uh, set this up as a command. So I type define. I'm just going to call it rpy3 because that connects to my Raspberry Pi. And then I want to do target remote. 192.168.32.2 colon 2001 end okay save that so now I'm going to debug pretty much as before so arm pocky beginning the API gdb minus x so minus x is going to point to the .gdb init, sorry, the gdb init file. And then the program is going to be hello world. OK, I think that's everything. Um, so that looks good. And now if I type rpy3, that should make the connection to the Raspberry Pi, which it does. Breakpoint on main, continue, step. OK, good. So that's going to save me some time uh, for the f uh, forthcoming um, demos. Good from that, we're done. Um, next
next thing. So command line GDB, as we've been using it, is all very well. Um, but maybe we can improve on that. So I want to look at a number of front ends to GDB. And I'm going to start off with one called the Terminal User Interface, or just plain TUI. Um, this is a part of the GDB package. Um, assuming it is enabled in your GDB cross compiler, you can just add minus TUI to the command string. So ARMPOCKY Linux in ABI, minus TUI, hello world, that will give us the TUI interface. And it looks a bit like, well, it looks exactly like this. Um, so it's, mm, it's an improvement. So the main thing is that we now have this window here uh, which shows us the code and as we uh, set breakpoints and, and uh, step through the code uh, the cursor advances. We can also see visually the breakpoints. This B plus indicates that the breakpoint on this line. As it happens the uh, GDB that we've built using um, uh, Yocto project doesn't have TUI enabled but no worries because there is another thing which I actually prefer to TUI in any case. Uh, there's a thing called CGDB uh, which is a Curses uh, uh, front end to GDB. It is quite like TUI but also better. Um, on Ubuntu it isn't available as a package or at least it isn't in the standard uh, um, lists um, so I had to actually uh, download a copy of CGDB and compile it and install it. And then having done that I can just use CG CGDB minus D and then the same string as previously. And it looks like this. Well it's a bit nicer than TUI to be honest, it's certainly more colourful. So we have syntax highlight highlighting which, which is quite nice. And although it isn't particularly obvious, this, the 7 in red here indicates that there is a breakpoint on line 7. And the 8 in green indicates that that is the uh, current place where we're at uh, in, in stepping through the code. And then the third one I want to look at is uh, DDD the good old data display debugger. This has been around for ages. Um, it keeps on working. It's still the best standalone graphical front end to GDB. So you install the package, D package DDD and then you can launch it with a particular debugger with the minus minus debugger option and then point it to your toolchain GDB. And it looks like this. So it is building on what you saw with TUI and CGDB, uh, but now we have a, uh, a third window, the one at the top, which is the data display window. Um, so we can put things here, for example, if I double click, um, well, okay, when, when, you run, um, when, when you run into um, a, a function ad tree in this particular case, then it uh, pops into here a thing called args, uh, which are the arguments, which are P and W in this case. And if the argument is a pointer, I can double click on that and it expands it. And if that contains pointers, I can double click on those and they expand and so on. So it is really, really nice for looking at uh, structures. Unfortunately, the, uh, the toolkit it uses uh, is really ancient, so it does look a bit dated, uh, but it works. The other thing I should mention before I move on is this floating window here. This gives us the uh, the tool, the, 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 the clicks we can use uh, to, for example, uh, single step. So we have step and we have next. Uh, we have finish and a few others I haven't mentioned. And it also has the run command here. Don't ever press the run button if you're doing cross uh, debugging. That will mess things up. There are also front ends for GDB in 
uh, a fairly wide range of IDEs, including Eclipse, uh, Visual Code, KDevelop, and a bunch of others too. Okay, so back to my demo. Uh, so this time I want to debug Hello World, but using CUGDB. So clear that out of the way. Is that GDB server running? Um, so I'm just going to do the same thing as before, but I'm going to add C, G, D, B, minus D, and that's it. Okay, um, so now it has immediately <laughs> displayed uh, the, 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 the first bit of the program in the window here. I'm going to make the connection to the Raspberry Pi. I do with RPi3. Now it changes because now it has made a connection with the uh, uh, GDB server. It knows the address that it's at and it now knows that actually we're in the startup code uh, for the C function. So we see instead a bunch of assembler. Um, I don't particularly want a single step through this. So I, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> so uh, I just typed N, and it, uh, it was smart enough actually to say, you probably don't want to do this. So um, it actually has put me uh, into um, the start of the program. Oh, no, it hasn't. It actually hasn't terminated. I wish I hadn't said that, no. Let's do that again. That is not what I meant to do. Okay, there is Hello World. Here's Okay, so now I want to type rpi3 to make the connection. Good. Now I want to set the breakpoint on main. And then I can continue. And now we're in, uh, in the C code. That looks better. So now I'm just going to step through this. And you can see that as we step, it advances the, uh, uh, the cursor and it shows you the next thing it's going to do. So that looks a bit, uh, a bit nicer to me. And eventually we start, we've, we've uh, exhausted the count and we drop out of the function and we're done. Okay, good. So far we're doing quite well. Okay, next topic. Um, I want to have a quick look at another way of looking at variables, and these are watch points. So a watch point is a kind of breakpoint that depends on a data value. For example, I can, uh, I can type watch i, and that will then uh, break whenever the value i is written to, which is handy. Notice this is a hardware watch point. Uh, in other words, uh, it, this is setting up some hardware registers on the chip uh, so that we don't have to single step through everything, checking whether I is changed on each uh, breakpoint or anything. It does this at full speed until we uh, hit the hardware watch point and then it stops. Now, not all hardware can support hardware breakpoints, but uh, hardware watch points, I mean, uh, but actually most of them can. That's a little bit crude. Maybe we want to be a bit more precise. So we can set a condition. We can say watch i if i equals 3, or indeed any other condition. That can be any variable. It doesn't have to be i. So in this particular case, uh, that means that we'll break when i equals 3. So if it changes to be 0, 1, 2, etc., it won't. When it hits 3, we will break. Okay, so let's do that for uh, for real. Same thing as before. Let's restart that, and let's restart that. Uh, IPy three break main continue. So now I'm going to set a watch point on 
Aye. Okay. And then I'm just going to hit continue and it should break whenever I is written to, which it does of course on every loop. Now, when we hit the watch point, it says the old value zero, new value is one, and it gives me the line of code which made that. Uh, continue again. Uh, now it is equal to two. And three, and four, and we're done. So let me just do that again, but this time I will set a conditional watch point. So R pi three break main continue. Now I want to type watch I if I equals three. Okay, now I type C. So now uh, it's gone round the loop uh, three times and it's just going round for the last time and we have uh, the break on I equals three and we're in the place that we'd expect us to be. So yeah, this is actually quite powerful, quite simple. We can set uh, breaks on variables to break when uh, when they become some interesting value or just when they change at all. Okay, right, next topic. Okay, stack frames. So, each function has its own stack frame. The stack frame contains the local variables and also return addresses and some, maybe some other things too. It's useful to be able to look at the stack frames uh, to see which functions have called which functions. So you can see the call tree from where you are currently in the code to all the ancestor functions that called uh, ultimately to this function. So the backtrace or bt command does exactly that. So here I'm in a function called add tree and I type bt. So uh, this then shows me that there are two ancestors for this. Add tree was called by itself because it's a recursive function. So stack frame one, uh, the ancestor is add tree. And the ancestor to the ancestor, stack frame two is main. Uh, so main called add tree, add tree called itself. Um, we can use the uh, info local command to see the local variables in each stack frame. And we can switch from one stack frame to another uh, using the frame and the frame number. So if I type, if I'm in uh, add tree, if I type frame two, I then see uh, the variables that were in the main function at the point at which it called me. So very handy stuff. So let's, get, uh, let's have a look at an example of this and see how it works. Uh, so for this, I'm going to use a program that is not Hello World uh, because I need a, a program that has uh, some functions in. So I'll use the uh, word counting program uh, that was in the uh, slide a couple of moments ago. So take a copy of that. It's from the samples directory. It's called word count. So there's a make file and a little test um, uh, file with some with some uh, words to be sorted. So let's build that, and then I'm going to copy that to the Raspberry Pi. Uh, word count R Pi three, and I'm going to put it into. Oh, I forgot to say root root at R Pi three, and I put it into user bin. I also will need the uh, sample data to test it with. So I do an SCP of test to root RPI3 
and I'm just going to put that in the home directory of the root user. Okay, then over here on the Raspberry Pi, there's my little test program. And it just contains a small number of words. And so my uh, word count program is going to sort them and also count them. So I do word count test. Okay, so now we have the same words but in the right order, uh, in the alphabetical order. <laughs> And we see there's one of each of them, except the there are two occurrences, one there and one there. Oops, so this seems to be working quite nicely. Um, so I'm going to use the uh, debugger now just to show you a little bit how it works and also uh, to demonstrate the stack frame feature. So GDB server, GDB server. Uh, port 2001, uh, user bin word count. Then over here, I'm going to debug it in the same way as we did uh, previously. Um, so I'm going to take a copy of the GDB init file that we had with Hello World. So we're going to copy uh, Hello World. G GDB in it to here and then I'm going to run this with C GDB as before C, uh, minus X GDB in it and then word count okay that should be everything launch that Make the connection to the Raspberry Pi. Break on main. Continue. Lovely. Um, so I'll just uh, step through it uh, one time uh, just to see what it does. Um, so it actually uh, defaults to using test.txt. Opens the file. File's there. It gets a word. Uh, what is the word? We can print it. Um, it is the okay that makes sense because that's the first word from the file <clears throat> uh, make sure that it is a sensible word and then it adds it to the tree so this is a, this is a, a tree sorting algorithm and then it gets another word okay so let's step into the add tree function now so I type s to step in so now I'm in a new stack frame. If I type backtrace, so uh, I'm now in add tree, and it's got as far as the word brown. And um, the main function is still there. I can actually step back to that. If I type frame uh, one in this case. So this is the place where we left the main function, uh, just as we're about to call add tree. If I type info local, for example, that will dump all the local variables in the main uh, function. So it gives me a file descriptor, it gives me a pointer to something, and the word brown, which is the one we're currently processing. Okay, switch back to the current frame. Let's step on a little bit further. So it uh, it is now iterating through uh, the uh, the tree, trying to find the place at which to uh, add brown. And it keeps on going left because we haven't found it yet. So it's stepping in another one. And now that trace, we're now three frames deep. So we have pretty much the, the example shown on the slide, in fact. So uh, main has called add tree, um, and then add tree has called add tree. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to let that run. I'm just going to type C for continue, and that will carry on and print out the, the messages. So the main thing I want to show is just that you um, 
uh, you can build up the, the stack frames and crucially you can, you can uh, uh, go back to other stack frames using the frame command. We'll maybe come to that uh, again later on when we look at core dumps. Core dumps are especially a good place when stack frames are good. Okay, so I'm quit from that and let's go on to the next topic. Okay, so to continue the story, the next topic I want to look at is debugging libraries. So there are two things to consider here. The first is that GDB needs to find the shared objects uh, for the libraries your, your, that your program links with, and it does that through the sysroot that we set earlier. But in addition to that, if you actually want to single step through this stuff or set breakpoints within it, you really want the source code for those libraries. So GDB is going to look uh, by default into two directories uh, set by the variables $cdir and $cwd. So $cdir is the compile directory. In other words, it's the directory in which the code was compiled, and this actually is put into the ELF header. So long as you haven't moved that code to a different directory, that will, that will work. And then CWD is the current working directory, so it will go look there as well. We can find out which directories are being used by typing show dir, and we can add a directory of our own uh, devising by adding dir and then a path. And you see that when you do that, it puts that at the front. So it will look, in this case, in my, for my lib, and then it will look in CDR, CWD. So most of the time, that does the right thing. However, particularly when you're using an SDK, as we are with the Yocto project SDK that we have installed, when you install the SDK, you inevitably install it into a different directory to the one uh, in which it was compiled. So for example, if we use the obj dump um, tool from our tool chain, and we look for the dwarf records, the debug records in a program, for example, Hello World, then we'll see that the compiled here is actually set to something like this. So we have user source debug, glibc, and then some big long path. Now, in actual fact, uh, that uh, is a subdirectory from our sysroot. So the place we really wanted to look is not in user source debug because there's nothing there. It actually needs to look in uh, opt pocky 313 sysroots uh, and so on slash user source debug. Okay, in other words, GDB doesn't know that the source code has been relocated into the sysroot. Um, we could go through and add lots of DIR commands, uh, as shown on the previous slide, for every single directory that contains library code. But there are many of them. It would be rather tedious to do that. So we can do this thing here instead. We can set set substitute path. And I want to substitute user source debug, which doesn't exist, with the sysroot, and then user source debug from the sysroot, which does exist. So let's try this out. Um, so for this, I'm going to use a program uh, which links with a library, actually two libraries. It links with the, the C library, of course. It's also going to link with the USB library, uh, libusb1, so that we can, um, yeah, we can try a couple of things out. So let me just compile that. I think I may have a, co a stale copy lying around. Let me just remove that. Uh, no. Oh, no, it wasn't there. Okay. So I'm going to copy USB demo from the sample code. And I have a make file and the code itself. So I'm just going to build it as usual. And then I'm going to copy this to the Raspberry Pi just so you can see what it's meant to do. So SCP USB demo to root at rpi3, and we'll put it in user bin as usual. Okay, then over here on the Raspberry Pi, I type USB 
us the demo and it is simply going to print out the IDs of the various USB devices plugged into my uh, Raspberry Pi. The exact details of what it prints out I'm not particularly interested in just now. I just want to demonstrate how to de debug it. So let's do that. No, let's not do that. <laughs> uh, so let's start GDB server as usual. Listening on port 2001, and we want to debug user in USB demo. And then over here on uh, my uh, development machine, uh, I want, first of all, I want the GDB init file we had earlier. So copy that from the good old Hello World program. And then I'm going to launch this with CGDB. So I want to do, first of all, arm pocky load GDB front end that with CGDB minus D that minus X. In practice, we will write a script for this, but I haven't, uh, for the purpose of this demo to make it clearer, I'm doing everything from scratch, almost everything. Uh, GDB init. USB demo. Okay, it's looking good. Uh, connect to the Raspberry Pi. Set a breakpoint on main. Continue. Excellent. Um, so the first thing it does is print out a message. I'd quite like to see if I can trace into that. So let's have a go at that first. So I type N, then I type S for step. And this takes me into the printf code, except that I don't see much code. I just see lots and lots of assembler. So that is because we don't have uh, the correct path to the source code for glibc. So let's just click on that. Yes, because we want to sort things out. So what I want to do now is to, and I, if you excuse me for a moment because there are some cribs I need to copy from over here. Um, so I need to look for that uh, compiled here, which is here somewhere, believe me. There we go. Apologies for the non-professionalism here. So I'm using the object dump and I'm looking for the uh, comp deer and I want to look for USB demo. So as shown on the slides we find the compile deer is set actually to something like this. So the uh, the C library at least is compiled in user source debug glibc. Da, da, da. And as we now know, that actually is actually is uh, situated in our um, uh, sysroot. So if we look in alt, okay, sysroots cortex, and then if we look in user src debug. So each one of these directories contains the source code for the uh, various things, including glibc, which is here. So I just need to put in the appropriate uh, substitute path, which I will do right away. So first of all, let's start db server over here. Rerun the debugger over here. Uh, but I'm going to set the substitute path command, and again, I'm going to copy my crib because it's quite a long string. Oops. So I type set substitute path, user source debug, and then the sysroot of the Pocky toolchain. Exactly as you would expect. So now let's see if that makes a difference. So uh, connect to the Raspberry Pi, break main, continue, step one line, and then step into printf. 
and now we see the source code. This is quite nice. So I'm just going to step through this. I'm not going to dwell on this too much because, to be honest, this is quite scary code and I don't really want to look at it. <laughs> but the main point is I can now see the source code for the C library. Oops. Um, so next, um, let's have a look at the, um, the USB library. So this is libusb1. So I should be able to do the same thing. If I step into that, no, oh, but it doesn't work. Um, so we see lots of assembler code and we see uh, down here um, that it is unable to find this file. Whoops, that file. And that's partly because uh, it's looking uh, in dot dot slash dot dot slash. Mm. Well, that's not going to work. So let's go back to the drawing board and see if we can find that file. So quit. Yes. So I know it's going to be in my sysroot somewhere. So I'm going to do a find. And we want to look in opt. Oops. Okay, sysroots, cortex, something. Uh, I suspect it'll be in user source, uh, debug. And I want to find core.c. And there it is. That is the directory then that contains the file. So let's just take a copy of that. Uh, just to make sure we got it right. <laughs> what went wrong? I missed a slash. There we go. Um, so there's the core C file and the other files that comprise, comprise uh, libusb. Um, so I can use a dir command to, uh, to deal with that. Oh, before I do that, let me just do one little thing. And again, I'm going to do this from the crib because I really want to keep that set substitute sys root, which we can have here. Okay, so that will be uh, run when I launch GDB now. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. Oh, but I need to remember this path. So, ah, it's getting fun, isn't it? So launch C, C GDB, connect to the Raspberry Pi. Uh -huh, that doesn't work because I haven't started GDB server. Now I have. Um, okay, break main, continue. Good. So now I'm going to add that directory to the search path for source code. OK, and now I can step through my code. Um, just to prove everything's still working, I can still step into printf. That still works. So just type finish to get out back out of that. And now I should be able to step into libusb. So step, yes. It is now find found uh, core.c, and I can step through this. OK, again, I'm not hugely uh, interested in exactly what this does. I just want to prove that I can actually look at uh, this code. And I can type the backtrace. Yeah, everything's all there. So I'm just going to type continue and let that program finish. And quit. So, next topic. Um, so the next thing I want to look at is uh, what I like to call just-in-time debugging, or how to attach to a running program. The situation here then is that you have a system that is running. It has a number of server processes um, chugging away. And you need, for some reason, to attach to and find out what one of them is doing. Maybe it's misbehaving, 
or maybe, as in the example we're going to look at just now, it is a program that started at boot time and it becomes uh, impractical to actually attach to it uh, initially. So you boot the system up and then you attach to the program and then you can go into debug. You can do these things using the attach uh, option of, of GDB server. Uh, and what you're going to attach to, you have to give the process ID of the, proce of the program you're going to attach. Once you've made the attachment, then GDB server will stop that program at a breakpoint, so the program stopped. Then we attach and uh, then we do the um, re target remote thing as normal from GDB, and then we have a regular debug session. And then when we're done, we can type detach in GDB. That will then release the program from control of GDB server, and it will go back to running in its normal way. So let's try all of those things out. So let's clear up here. Oops. And here. Um, so for this, I'm going to be using, um, well, we need to find a, a, a program to, to, uh, to debug. Um, I'm actually going to debug the init program. So init is uh, the first thing that runs, it's this guy here, and it has process ID 1. I need to find the executable for that because I'm going to be using that in a moment uh, in the development machine. So that, it turns out, actually we can find out. If we look in proc, the PID number, which is 1, and CMD, uh, that's the wrong one. Uh, you know what, I'm actually going to, I know where it is. <laughs> it is going to be in uh, SBIN. And if we look for init, uh, minus L, then there is a slash SBIN slash init and that is a pointer to slash sbin slash init sv init. So that is the actual executable. So that's the thing we're gonna, gonna debug. So bear that in mind for a moment. So then over here, uh, I need to find the executable for that. So that'll be in opt pocky, uh, and then I want to look in the sys root and cortex has been in it. Okay, so that is the copy uh, on the, within the sys root. So I'm going to load that into the debugger on the development side, and then on the Raspberry Pi side, I'm going to attach to to that process to process one. So over here, then we're going to do gdb server minus minus attach 2001 and then I'm attaching to PID 1. Okay, that worked. That does mean of course that uh, uh, the init program actually stopped at the moment. Um, that doesn't matter in this particular case but just bear in mind that you want to be careful what it is you stop. And then over here then, I need to run the, the uh, debugger. Uh, but the thing I need to debug now is not USB demo, it is in fact the thing on the line above. Okay, so far so good. So make the connection. So now when I make the connection, um, the uh, the, the source window here, this has now put me in the context where the init program was when it was stopped by GDB server. I can type backtrace and we can see that uh, we're currently in libc do syscall, so it's made a C library call uh, which is called from libc do syscall, which is called from something select, which is called from select.c, which is called from check init FIFO, which is called from etc etc 
So we're in the C library, unsurprisingly. We're at uh, a blocking system call called select, and we're presumably waiting for something to happen. So I'm just going to step out of this because we're way down in assembly code right now. And there we go. So there's actually a timeout there of, of some seconds. And where are we now? Let's uh, step up another level. OK, so this is the select function call that init had made. And if you look up a little bit, you see actually it does a, a timeout of five seconds. That's why there was that, dis uh, that delay there. And now I can just step through this and see what it is it's doing. Um, let's go to the start of the. So this is the main loop uh, within init. And it is uh, making sure everything's looking OK. This is the point where it calls chat init FIFO, so it's seeing if anybody is, is talking to it. If we just step into that. And it's doing some stuff with a pipe. Uh, this is the point where it calls the select function. We just uh, started that a few minutes ago. That has a five second timeout on it. Two, three, four, five. Yep. And then we go around the loop again. OK, so I think that's good enough um, for, uh, for now. So I'm going to let init carry on its way. I'm going to detach. Uh, so over here we see that GDB ha server has it, uh, detached, and now everything's back to normal. Excellent. So now we need to go on to the next topic, um, which is core dumps. So let's talk about core dumps and why they're useful and what we can do with them. So you get a core dump when a program goes wrong. The core dump then is uh, what we call the volatile state of the program. So it's uh, the data segment, uh, the heap, anything that may be mapped into the ma mmap area, such as uh, data from libraries and such, and of course the stack. So all of this stuff is, when it generates a core dump, is written to a file called core. Uh, and we can then use that within GDB. We can re uh, we can reestablish this uh, this environment, and then we can see what's going on. We can look at these data values. We can look at the stack. You'll find, however, that by default you don't get core files. Um, there is a limit called R limit core, which is a, uh, a per user limit. And in order to create a core file you need to increase our limit core to be something greater than zero. Um, you also have to make sure that you have uh, the, the, the user that's going to create the core file um, has the permissions to write to the directory where it's going to write the core file. And there's also a restriction that if the program has the set user ID bit set, then it will not generate core files because that is a security problem. The bottom line is that you won't get core files unless you type this command, ulimit minus c unlimited. That sets the limit for core files to be unlimited. Incidentally, be aware that these core files can be quite big. Even on simple programs, they are likely to be a few megabytes. But the bigger the uh, data segment and the more stack you have, then the bigger the core file. So on big, graphic, heavy programs, you can easily have core files that are hundreds of megabytes. Now, where is this core file going to be um, stored? So by default, you will get a file called core, C-O-R-E, and it's placed in the current working directory of the program that crashed, which co created the core file. This is not particularly convenient, especially on embedded systems. You end up with core files scattered all over the place, um, and they may not be possible. They may be your, your, um, uh, your bin directory uh, or your user directories are read-only, in which case creating a core file in one of those would not work. 
So it's really, really nice to have this feature here. You can write to this file uh, a core pattern. And this is a specification of where you want the core files to be uh, stored and what you want them to be called. Um, the man page for core tells you the full details. Um, but here is a good example. If we create uh, a directory called core files, and we can use specifiers like percent %e, percent %p, and this will determine the name of the core files, so the name of the files rather, when it generates a core. So percent %e uh, expands to be the name of the executable that generated the core, and then percent %p expands to the current PID of that program. Having created uh, the core file, uh, you will need to copy that to your development machine and then you can launch GDB like this. So now we're not going to attach to GDB server, there's no GDB server involved here. We run our GDB from the tool chain, we give the program that, uh, we, we, we tell GDB the, the program that, that crashed so that it knows, uh, uh, so it can find the, um, the, the, the symbol tables. And then we give it the name of the core file uh, that contains the volatile state. And it should give us something like this. So it should show us the line of code where everything went wrong. And then we can uh, look at the variables, the, the, the local variables, the global variables, and we can look at the backtrace. Uh, so let's try that one out. So back to there and clear up from previously. Um, so for this, I have another one of my little demo programs. Uh, it's called May Crash. In fact, it will crash. Uh, so from the sample code, and oh, looks like there's some, some stuff in there. Let me just clean that up. And there's an old core file there. That's better. Right, so if I now build that, copy it to the Raspberry Pi, Pi 3, and as usual, I put it into the user bin directory. So now if I run that program, um, it prints out one message and then we get a segmentation fault. There is however no core file. So if I type ulimit minus a, that tells me the various limits uh, for this user. And the important one for us is this one here, uh, core block size, sorry, core file size in blocks is set to zero. So we're not gonna get a core file. So we change that, we type u limit minus c unlimited. There we go. So now if I type may crash, It says segmentation fault core dumped. And there's my core file. Uh, in this particular case, the core file is not particularly big because this is a tiny little program. Um, the next thing is, as I said, having these files called core scattered all over the place is kind of inconvenient. So let's create a directory. Oh, I may already have created this before. Um, and then I want to tell uh, the kernel to write stuff into that directory. So we do echo um, core files forward slash percent e minus percent p. And I want to write that to um, 
slash proc. Oh, my type is getting worse. Proc sys kernel uh, core pattern. Okay, um, I think there may be something already in that directory, so I'm just going to clean that directory out so we're in a, a good state. And now I'm going to run my make crash program again. So it says uh, core dumped, and now if I look in slash core files, there indeed is the core file. Should be about the same size, about 300k. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so my program's crashed. I have captured the uh, the core file. I just need to copy that to my development machine and run GDB and find out what went wrong. So over here, I want to copy from the Raspberry Pi. And I want to copy from core files. And it's May 500. So 500 is the, is the process ID, the PID, uh, when it actually crashed. So now we have that uh, in the development machine. So now I can run CGDB as before, well, almost as before. And ignore all that stuff. I don't really need GDB in it at this point. Actually, I do need GDB in it because I only need to find the <clears throat> okay, we don't have GDB in it. I do need that because it's handy to have the sysroot set up so it'll find uh, any library code and such like. So go grab this once again from the good old hello world. GDB in it. And then let's do the same, same thing again. So apologize for it. Let's do this a smart way. Control R. C G D B. And then I want, instead of that, the program I want to look at is called May Crash. And then I want to also use the core file, which is called May Crash 500. Return. OK, so this now tells us um, what happened. Um, yeah, okay. So core uh, generated by a program called May Crash. Uh, it was terminated by six segv segmentation fault. And then up here, you can see the line of code. So th this is the actual line of code where it terminated. So uh, we have p, which is null. And we're trying to write a number to uh, a null pointer, which gives us the crash. We should also be able to do things like print the backtrace, which I think you can probably guess, but there you go. Uh, we can look at locals. There's only one. I can change stat frames uh, to stat frame one, for example. That puts this into the main function, and I can type info local that contains um, just one local variable i which is currently set to zero. Um, so, cool. Now I can look at stack dumps. So, coming back to the, uh, the presentation, then we're nearly done now. Uh, I just have a few final thoughts and then um, we can sign off. So first of all, uh, this is, has been a, a tutorial, an introduction to uh, debugging with GDB. Um, there is uh, some good resources, uh, in particular, the, the first of all, this uh, uh, Peter J. Saltzman uh, book, highly recommend that. Uh, goes into great depth of, GD, of GDB and also DDD and Eclipse. 
Uh, there's this really handy Arnold Re Re Robbins book, um, The Pocket Reference, which is a little bit out of date, but most of it is still up to date. Uh, and of course, there is this book written by this person called Chris Simmons, um, chapter 14, remember, um, uh, talks about debugging. And so that is the end of the tutorial, and um, I apologize for the really rubbish uh, uh, demos, but hopefully you'll get something from this. Um, if you have any questions, please go ahead and ask them, and uh, I will be live at, uh, to, to, uh, to answer your questions as best I can. Meanwhile, you can contact me. Uh, I have a, my blog is called Looking After the Inner Penguin. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter and you can also link with me on LinkedIn. So thank you all very much for, uh, for tuning in and I hope you found this useful. Talk to you later.